Hello everyone and welcome back to another EU4 guide. This one time we're going to do the dive yet. But before I dive in, just to remind people that if you do enjoy these guys, please do like, do comment, and do subscribe. It encourages me to make more of them and I greatly appreciate it. So, dive it here, which would later, of course, be known as Vietnam and the site of an, a very bad American defeat in the Vietnam War. However, at this point in time, you are probably, eh, you're much smaller than you would be historically in the future, and you're also kind of crippled. So I've played most of these nations in this area, or at least trying them out, and the Dai Viet are definitely one of the most crippled nations at the start. The Khyber disaster, which I thought was absolutely awful, pales in comparison to the issues of the Dai Viet. It's not that they're a weak nation, it's just they have lots of problems, and more importantly, they have lots of future coming problems you can see. So let's quick go over their ideas, and then we'll do starting moves, and then actually we'll do ideas, then we'll do starting setup, and then we'll do the missions. That's what we'll do. So the Dai have one attrition for enemies in all provinces, which is absolutely amazing, because all their provinces, with the exception of their capital, are jungle provinces, um, but they're all tropical. So the uh, the level of attrition people are going to take marching through your lands is about 5% a month, um, which is absolutely crippling during sieges. Gets even worse if you take defensive ideas and boost it to around 6 or so, or you even do Scorched Earth, which makes things even more painful for your invaders. Basically, uh, the Daiviet might be the most defensive nation in the game, but um, I'm not entirely sure on that, but they're definitely right up there. They also have a cheaper cultural conversion cost, which is kind of interesting. Um, I don't do a lot of culture converting, but you do have a mission to convert this area culturally, so I suspect that's why they start with it. Then they get 10 infantry combat ability, 1 yearly prestige, 20% fort defense, again doubling down on their defensiveness. You put a fort with a defensive edict on in a jungle province, and you can really inflict some nasty... Uh, casualties. Then they can get 25% manpower, negative 10 core creation cost, plus one yearly, yearly legitimacy, or if they have the mandate of heaven, 0.05 mandate growth per year, which is nice. And to cap it off, they get a negative five tech cost and 10% morale of armies. So not necessarily the strongest in terms of administrating their lands, but definitely a mili military and expansion um, with a lot of defense thrown in nation, for sure. And let's get into their starting stuff. So first off, you always want to take this, basically. Monastic education gets one missionary strength, plus one max promoted cultures. It's always a good start. You start off the game here in a regency um, for your heir, who is absolutely terrible. This guy is he's not as bad as the Spanish heir, but he's pretty awful. Uh, you just start off with a good regent, and thankfully through the new Leviathans, you can keep extending the regency for a while. Uh, I recommend you expand it. When I did it, uh, I don't know if it's a scripted event or not, because it happened two completely different times for me in two of my test games, uh, that you'll get an event that allows this lady here, uh, I suspect she's the mother or something, or whatever, she has a chance of becoming the ruler and uh, if you get that event, definitely take it, because she is a much better ruler than this guy. Once you put her as a ruler, you want to disinherit this guy as soon as you can. Um, if you guys, if you do get this guy on the throne, you want to make sure he gets married, has a child, and then you can abdicate them <laughs> basically as soon as possible. Um, I'll explain the reasons behind that later. So, other starting moves. Um, you start off absolutely crippled. You start off with only 19... Um, almost 20. I actually advise going to one of your less developed provinces. Mm, where's the best one? Eh, probably this one and spending one Diplo point here to at least get you to 20. Um, you want to get this, your crown line, to at least 50 for one of your missions. So you want to start off by immediately seizing land. You're still going to have this very nasty penalty for a while. Um, it's really a severe problem. You'll also notice that you also have a nobility... Uh, privilege granted. Command of the military. Looks good. Boosts nobility influence by 30. Gives one yearly army tradition to your army tradition. 
Um, but it does give, makes all your army leaders 20% more. And also, it doesn't say here, if you hire a leader, it gives the estate 5% influence. So if you're not careful, it's very easy to hit 100 influence with this nation, uh, with this state, which will cause trouble for your nation. So um, that's something to be aware of here. You need to revoke this at some point, but in order to revoke it, you have to get their loyalty higher than their influence, which will take quite a while considering they own 42% of your country right now. So what do we do with the monastic orders? Well, we first go over here, put on oversight by the monastic orders, uh, monopoly on incense. And I think that's might be all we want to do to start. So long as we get the equilibrium above 50, that's all you need for reform um, privileges. So in terms of the merchants, give them tropical city planning. Uh, it's up to you if you want to give them private trade fleets. I tend to give it to them just for the extra trade power, uh, but it does increase their influence quite a bit. But if you don't, you want to take free enterprise. If you really want to get the full benefit, you put on both. Always save one privilege slot because you want to be able to put in the monthly one Diplo admin military power. The nobility, it gets a little bit trickier here. So you want to give stuff to the nobility that gives them loyalty without giving them tons of privilege like most nations you want to take increased levies immediately however this will give them a massive um, boost to their influence and you don't want to do that yet which makes this quite difficult you may not want to give anything to them at the beginning but if you do um, i do recommend you give them rights of counsel it balances out influence with loyalty and more importantly it keeps their equilibrium above 50. Uh, you want it above 50 so that you can freely use, um, uh, basically steal the land for the crown um, without causing revolts in your lands. And this setup will do that. I don't recommend you start summoning the diet that much unless you're going to revoke. In fact, you don't want to summon the diet at all if you can avoid it because it gives influence to estates and you need to keep your nobility influence as low as possible. Let's see, what else? Uh, you want to take your trade ships, put them here, move them to Canton, put them on uh, return at war. You want to increase the amount of light ships you have. You want to go down here, and this guy is collecting trade here, but he's making no money. So you want to actually move him back to your trade center from Siam. Uh, it will increase your trade just a bit. You don't make a ton of money from trade, but it'll be enough. Uh, let's see what else. You do not want to hire any advisors. You are pretty much totally broke. In fact, I recommend that you mothball forts. Uh, if you want to try and see uh, what to do with diplomacy, if you want to try and find allies, there's very few people who are willing to be your allies at the start of the game. You do start as a tributary of the Ming, and in fact, the best strategy I have found is to go to the Ming and do curry favors on them. And basically just always have somebody improving relations with the Ming, currying favors, make sure your royal marriage to them, because once you get 10 favors, you can then start stealing ducats and soldiers from them, um, which will be very useful. Um, if you can keep stealing ducats and soldiers, you'll be able to finance your wars and your development, but you'll also be able to have manpower, which otherwise you'll run out of. You do start out here with a... Uh, army leader, which you want to put in your army and immediately start drilling. Um, you don't want to hire another military general because, as I said, it will increase the nobility influence by 5% and you want to avoid that. But uh, it does exist. Um, I tried to, I recommend you try to avoid hiring any generals unless you absolutely need it. This nation over here, Wang Fuan, I guess, uh, you start out guaranteeing them, as do La Zhang, Lan Yang, or whatever. Um, so I recommend you do ally them, or at least you do a royal marriage with them. Uh, we'll talk more about that why later, but you want to get your relations with them as high as possible, so that at some point you should be able to vassalize them. Uh, what else? If you're not going to use your fleet over here, you want to mothball your galleys. Um, it will save you money, and money is something very precious at the beginning here for the Dai Viet. Uh, you can, if you want to, send a diplomat down here to start building a spy network up on Champa. However, 
since you're in a regency council, which is a little odd, um, it feels like this should be a, just, you know, a normal regent, you can't actually declare war. Um, since you have a regency council, we cannot start any wars, uh, which means until you get out of this regency, which you don't necessarily want to because you want the monarch points, uh, you're a bit stuck. You can't really expand. Uh, so, in the case of you not being able to spend, you do have the option here, and I will mention this, is if you wanted to pass inwards perfection, you could decrease your development cost. However, be aware, it does cost you crown lens, so you don't want to do this now, but um, once you get above 50 influence here and complete submissions, and you're not expanding, it might be worth passing, but overall, three development cost, it's nice, it's not really that amazing, though, so... You can do it, you cannot do it, it's up to you. Uh, if you're going to hire an advisor, I recommend hiring a uh, admin tax advisor. Uh, you can't do, obviously do that at the beginning. Don't hire a trade efficiency and don't hire a um, military one at the beginning. And then the delightful fun of setting your rivals occurs. I recommend the Chimer and your direct neighbor here, whose name I'm always going to get wrong, and then the Chompa if you want. The Champa will basically never get allies, and they're going to probably be your first conquest. If you get really lucky and you get the event where this lady becomes queen, uh, then you're out of the regency and you can invade them, which is why starting to build a spy network there will work. If these guys ally anybody, it's these three tiny nations here, which you can also easily conquer as well, and I do recommend doing. So, last thing is, before we talk missions, is disasters. The Diviate have a unique disaster. It's called the, the Northern and Southern Dynasties. If you do not have a ruler with admin skill higher than three, diplo skill higher than three, military higher than three, and it's in the Age of Discovery, which starts around 14, uh, 1500, you start to have this disaster, and it is rather devastating. Um, you want to try and avoid it. It can easily split your country into pieces. And obviously you don't want to do that. The way to prevent that is you basically have to pass a... Oh, it doesn't actually tell you here. There's a way to prevent this and it's in your missions. So let's jump to that. So these are the mission trees for the Divi. It's not a bad mission tree. Over here you've got your standard uh, conquer uh, or subjugate, get more subjugation, get more subjugation that's similar to this area. So I'll just run through it quickly. The first one is Wang Fuan here, or however you say it. Uh, if you can make them your vassal or conquer them, uh, you will get a claim to subjugate these guys here, which is, it's a tough war. Be aware, this is going to be a very hard war. They're equivalent or larger in size to you. And more importantly, they're probably going to get a tech lead and they're gonna have allies. So just be aware, triggering that early, it's not something you wanna to do to ready to invade. This is why I said try and get uh, the opinion of these guys up to around 190. If you're lucky, uh, the Ayutthaya or the Chimer go to war with these this red nation here, and they almost always ally this one province nation here that you wanna take over, which means they'll be in a war. These guys almost always lose their initial starting war. In the four test games I did, they lost the starting war every time, regardless of who attacked them. And as a result of that, this nation will get weakened. And if you get lucky, which I have done every game, their opinion of you to be vassalized will go up. Um, their economic... My, my economic base will then exceed theirs, the military base will exceed theirs, and if you got 190, you may have to go and give them um, trade favors for trust, which is why you want to either ally them, royal marriage, and probably curry favors with them. You can easily get them as your vassal without fighting, which makes it a lot easier because these guys usually stay guaranteed to them. However, if they do ally them, they will break the guarantee, so it is possible to invade after the war. I just find it easier to peacefully take over, by and large. Um, so that is this tree right here. Once you subjugate them, you'll get a subjugation on these guys here. Once you subjugate them, you get a subjugation on Ayutthaya. Once you subjugate Ayutthaya, you get, um, you get permanent 2.5 discipline for the rest of the game, and you get a permanent claim on the, whoops, the Burma region here. So you can then conquer that area. Now the other tree is slightly 
more complex. It involves conquering the Champa to their south, which is easily, which is not that hard to do. The issue is the Chimer will also be trying to conquer them. Um, so you probably won't get all this land, which will delay you for a while. But it's not so much a simple matter as conquering them. You have to own them. And the culture has to be Vietnamese, which means you have to conquer them, wait a period of time, convert them to your religion, and then culturally convert them once their separatism is gone. So this will take you a lot longer than you'd expect, but once you're done, you will have extended your Vietnamese culture, which is really tiny at the start, all the way down here. So that is these missions. So let's go down the stop the disaster. Right here is the prevent division disaster uh, mission. So in order to do this, you have to complete all the ones above you and have two stability. So let's go over them. The easiest one here is restore examination. You basically have to enact the examination system, have an admin, diplo, and military advisor. This one took me quite a while to figure out because for the life of me, I couldn't figure out where examination system is. So I will tell you, it is actually here. It is a tier three bureaucracy reform. It basically reduces nobility influence by 10%, which is really useful on you who has nobility issues. And you get possible advisor plus one. You also start with a unique Confucian bureaucracy government, um, which makes your advisors cheaper, which is really nice. Um, I will talk something here. The level two noble privilege reform, you'll have a choice between strength and noble privileges or curtail them. If you're having trouble with the getting the nobility influence below um, I think it's below its loyalty, I recommend you do take curtail noble privileges. It'll get you more tax. You won't have the manpower, which is super strong, but it will allow you, combine these two will give you negative 20 to their influence which considering this will put you at 53, the two reforms you have here. And uh, if it'll put you at 53, and then this will be down to 46. Then you can freely revoke the uh, control of the military, which is required for the control of the army mission, which you also have to complete. Get your army size to 100% of the force limit, have nobility loyalty of 40 or greater, and have not granted command of the military privilege to the nobility. Since they already have it, you have to revoke it. Then they have to keep their loyalty pretty good and you have to build to 100% of the force limit. Out of these ones, I found having the 100% force limit a problem. You can support 20 troops at the beginning, but your economy cannot support 20 troops at the beginning of the game. And as you grow and expand, I found that it's actually really hard to afford an army at that full scale. Um, it's doable, but it's tricky. Also be aware that for the restore examination here, you have to make sure you're not running a deficit. Um, it's not particularly hard. You can mothball stuff, but I should point that out. Now the one in the middle, you have to get land owned by the crown of 50% and the nobility influence lower than 40. The nobility influence lower than 40 is not an issue, especially if you've controlled the army first. But the 50% land own is really tricky. So basically every five years, you'll have the ability to seize land for the crown. You have to do it, obviously if you do it once at the start of the game, you have to do it another five times minimum, um, unless you develop 5% of your land, which you can do, um, but it's not the most reliable method of gaining crown land. Now once you do that, and you've got their influence below 40, you can then pass that, get 15% tax modifier for 20 years, and if you control the army, you'll get five discipline. Once you've done all of that, you can prevent the division of the Diviet from the north and south, and you'll also get a nice negative 10% stability cost for the rest of the game, which is really handy. Um, just helps a little bit. Now you've got a couple separate paths here. The one on the left is your standard, let's invade the Ming. Uh, basically, if you break free of the Ming, you insult the Ming, and you've prevented the division, you can insult them. Once you've insulted them to complete this mission, they'll lose 20 mandate, which is really painful for the Ming. It will give you a good opportunity to invade them. You'll get a permanent claim on this area. You conquer this area. Uh, actually, you conquer Canton here. And then you will get claim on South China. Once you conquer South China and Canton, you can become Emperor of China, because at that point, the Ming are probably collapsed, and you can claim the mandate. Then you can complete the mission, the Mandate of Heaven Happens. The other, uh, the middle one here is 
less important. Um, you can basically improve relations with the Japanese, and if you do that, you'll get a diplomatic reputation for 20 years. That's about it. Basically, you want to improve it with whoever owns Kyoto, which is almost always going to be the Shogun, unless the Shogunate collapses. Uh, then you can purchase Western Arms here. If you meet a European country that has a province in the Indonesian super region, has an opinion of 100, you've got an army tuition of 50, you can buy European Arms till the end of the game, which is, gives you a wonderful 10% siege ability and a less useful negative 30% artillery cost. Nothing to scoff at though, artillery is expensive. Uh, it'll save you about 9 gold a purchase on the artillery out of 30. So 21, eh, 9 gold. It's pretty useful. The last one here is Faith and Learning Tree. If you have 15 temples, religious unity of 90, you will get monastic learning. Negative 5 idea cost for the rest of the game, which is very nice. Um, basically, if you can stop the division, uh, it becomes much easier for you to expand and everything. Then you can do state education if you have 10 universities. You can then get institution spread and prestige, less useful. But here, if you've got the development of this province to 30, and you have the development of this province down here to 30, you can complete it and you'll get an empire rank automatically, even if you're not empire sized, and you'll get the event, the Imperial Citadel, Imperial Citadel which I will not spoil because it's a fun little event. Now, the strategy for these guys is at least until you get the examination system, you don't want to conquer much. The reason is to get your first reform here will take you a while. And once you've got your uh, tier two reform, it's going to take you another 20 years or so to get to the third tier reform. Uh, it's fat. It's you can get there faster if you're really lucky and you get events. Of course, you could have negative events as well. Um, once you get the examination system, you no longer care about your reform progress as much. The reason you don't want to expand prior to this is your reform progress is based off your autonomy. So if you go nuts and conquer this whole area, your autonomy is going to be so high, you're never going to get to tier 3 reform by 1500. You only have 56 years and to complete this, and it does take a while. You can do it if you're really good. You take the land, you lower the autonomy, but then you have to repress the revolts. Uh, it can become quite difficult. So I advise at least don't conquer much beyond the Champa region. Uh, if you can subjugate these guys or make them vassals, that is almost more ideal than taking the land because it keeps your autonomy low. Uh, don't bother to make these vassals. It's really not worth it. Um, the Champa seem to be a little bit tricky to vassalize. I don't know if it's a bug or something, but I wasn't able to do it the couple times I conquered them. It didn't give me the option to vassalize them, which was strange. Um, and these guys over here, if you can subjugate them, good, good for you, but it's hard. Now, because you have a good regent here and you can't declare wars for the first, you know, 12 years of the game unless you get the event, the odds are you're going to be sitting here with a lot of monarch points. So you could either take tech or... If you want to have a better start, you sit, you sit on those monarch points until the Renaissance fires. Once the Renaissance fires, you go in here, you do the encourage development. If you're really lucky, you get an event that decreases, that gives you rainy season. Um, and if you're lucky, you get 200 gold here and you can upgrade this um, center of trade to level two. That will give you as many decreased modifiers here to improving this land and you're going to want to improve it. So. I believe it is 37 the point at which you will get the institution. So um, if you do take these lands, don't pillage their capital. It'll make it much harder. The reason you want to do it in your capital, which is already 20 development, is outside of your capital. These are all jungle with a 35 development penalty, which is massive. Even though you've done tropical city planning, you will still have a 5% develop penalty from tropical. So these are more like 40%. Um, and that is basically, with this exception here of mountains, which is 25% development cost, that is your only non, or these provinces are all mountains, it's your only non-jungle province. So this is surprisingly, despite being 20 development, the best I have found to develop the institution is, plus it's your capital, um, which is always a good thing because at the last stage you have to have 50 development. 
Plus, in the Age of Discovery, if you get your capital to 30 development, you'll get at least one or two of these um, Splendor ideas here. And uh, that's basically how you start. Uh, I'm going to load up one of my games in which I have screwed up massively, just so I can show you kind of the, the risk of playing them. Um, this was a run I pretty much lost within like five years after this. So I wanted to show it to you. So obviously we've expanded down here. We got some of the Champa. We managed to not actually complete any of these mainly because I haven't got the Diplo advisor set up, but I could do that pretty easily. Um, I could actually do it right now to, um, to show you guys that. So we go in here, complete the examination, get 100 admin power. I have, however, revoked control of the military, but because my force limit is 31, I can't actually uh, support that an army of that size, let alone the fact that I'm struggling with manpower. Um, however, I have got nobility influence of 40, and I've gotten the crown land to 42. I made a mistake and clicked on this one, which gave admin power to the clergy early on and cost me five. Otherwise, I would be at 50 now. So about 1480 or so, you can, or you can do it a little earlier. I could complete this prevent division. I did it again in a different game, and I got it in 1477, I think I managed to do it. Um... Getting to this took a while, but as you see, we managed to easily accomplish getting to the examination system. We revoked the nobility privileges. We were in good shape. I managed to peacefully vassalize these guys, and I was working on subjugating these guys, and I did. The problem is the sheer amount of attrition in the land just drained my manpower. I went through two whole drilled army um, slackened manpower, getting manpower from China, getting manpower from Ayutthaya, who then obviously turned on me, and I still couldn't maintain an army. So I just won the war here with these guys, subjugated them, so obviously they hate me. Um, but then immediately the Khmer declared on me, and because they're a Ming tributary, they can do that safely, whereas Ayutthaya has not. Um, can't do anything. Um, Ayutthaya broke free, so... They're not a huge risk. But, as you can see, I'm probably not going to win this war. Um, they outnumber me 2-1. to one. They have Pegu in here. Pegu will show up with a 6th Division Army. And I will struggle to defeat the Khmer and lose. Well, not really lose, but um, get pushed back and become small. The reason is, because I developed to the... Um, I developed my capital to... It wasn't at 45. I did pillage a bit. Um, I think it was 37 or so. Um, because of that, I fell behind in tech and ideas. And I declared war on these guys when they were Miltech 6. I was Miltech 5. Even though I had twice their army, they almost bled me dry. Um, they actually did bleed me dry, and then I recovered a bit. Um, but then they, they've got endless amounts of rebels that I lost most of my manpower repressing. So... The, the mistake I made, and don't make it, is to invade these guys until you're equivalent in tech, or you get defensive ideas to the second or third level. Once you get to the third level, 10% infantry combat, 10% morale, um, you'll be the strongest military one in the area if equivalent in tech, outside of obviously the main. So I recommend defensive ideas for the first idea because of the morale, because of the maneuver, and because of the attrition. The maneuver and the attrition will reduce the amount of people you lose to the environment. I think when I looked at it, I had lost, I think 25,000 troops due to attrition, sieging these guys down um, just because of jungle and monsoon penalties. It's horrific. Um, I took expansion as the second idea. I actually kind of recommend expansion as the idea here, unless you feel the need to go influence to keep subjects happy or admin to take land. Because you have dot tropical jungle planning, you actually get a settler increase to some degree. So you can, um, let me just grab this. Um, there's a 5% chance that you can develop. Obviously it's 45, so it's rather high. Um, but you can use it to develop some of these provinces further. And more importantly, you are in range to actually colonize uh, both Taiwan 
and the Philippines and then move into Indonesia that way. And you can probably get to it sooner than anyone else. So it's quite possible. Uh, if you want to expand quickly, go repress native repression policy. If you want to expand safely, go native coexistence policy. Um, the other reason to go expansion is at the end, you get minimum autonomy in territories, you get another merchant, you get some relations, settler increase and in trade power, all of which are pretty useful. Um, you could even go and colonize Australia if you want. I did that. That was kind of cool. So the other thing is you'll notice up here, I have a Confucian icon. So at, I think it was like four or five game, um, years into the start of the game, there's an event that fires, which allows you to either go Confucian and kind of align yourself more with the Ming, which I'm not sure historically what they kind of did. As far as I'm aware, Vietnam kind of straddles the line between Confucian and Buddhist for a long time. I went Confucius here because it's harder. And if you do, though, you can then harmonize these religions and get bigger bonuses. Thankfully, Mahayana Buddhism is immediately harmonized, which is good because all your land is this faith, which is exciting. Um, no one else in this area has your um, faith, basically. Now, there is an achievement for the Dai Viet, which is called Disciples of Enlightenment. And I don't really know how you're going to pull it off in this uh, in this patch, but you can. It's have 10 nations following the Mahayana faith by 1500. As you can see, I haven't expanded much, even if we assume I was one of them, needing nine more. I've got a subject here, which I could force to be two. If I had subjugated these guys, that could be three, four, maybe five. If I had subjugated the Champa, six. These guys I could force for seven. I still would need to find three more nations. Um, I Well, you can actually release some nations here if you want to, because you do start off with several nations inside your own. You could release Anam here, which would give you another one. You could release Tonkin up here, which would give you one or two. Um, actually, I don't know if you can, because Tonkin's part of your capital one. Um, if you do invade and conquer these guys, if you take this province here, you can release Lu Prabang, which so technically that could get you to nine. If you subdued these guys to Sweni, so if you took these two from these guys in a subjugation war, you then use one of them to fabricate a claim on some nation over here, um, maybe using your subjugation on La Na here, conquer them, conquer these nations here, force them to your Mahayana faith, you could pull it off before 1500. It would be very tough. Um, you'd probably not be able to prevent the division disaster, which could fire at any point there. But it is doable. Um, it's just going to be super tricky. It's probably going to ruin your run. So don't do it on a game you want to continue on. Um, I will point out the fact that even... Though you are Buddhist, these area, people down here are not going to particularly love you. Um, the Buddhists get along reasonably well with each other, but not as good as other faiths. And down here, you've got some Hindu provinces, which you will want to convert, and you will need to convert them if you go Buddhist in order to, lead, in order to culturally convert them. However, if you go Confucian, like I did, and you harmonize with them, which I'm in the process of doing... Um, once you harmonize with the Hindu faith, you can then culturally convert them. Um, we can prove that by looking up here in the Zhuarang. We can change the culture to Vietnamese, even though they are of the Buddhist one. But because they're true believers because of our Confucian religion, they get along. Now, if you go Confucian, I should mention that you want to go to your priests and give them the clerical minister's privilege which will give yearly harmony increase of 0.25 because if harmony goes down when you integrate it, uh, it can cause some serious issues. As you see, the development cost is up, tolerance to the true faith is down, yearly legitimacy is negative. These are all major problems uh, for a nation. So that helps a little bit. And sometimes you can get events to keep it up. Um, but once you harmonize with the religion, then you want to let it build up, then harmonize with the next religion. The pagan group, I think, is... Uh, yeah, it's 0.5 negative unrest for the rest of the game. The Dharmics, which are the Hindus, is tolerance of true faith of one. Um, so if you do go 
tolerance of the uh, Confucius, you can easily get all this, all these religions here fully tolerant, which is nice. If not, as these guys, you have to convert it all, in which case, as your first idea or second idea group, rather than expansion, you may want to go religious so that you can convert it. I think that is everything for the Diviate I need to go over. Um, there's a lot there. It's a very complex nation. It is horribly sabotaged at the beginning of the game. It's not till about 1480, if you play right, that you'll actually feel like you're playing the game rather than just watching a point simulator increasing your admin, diplo, and military power. So hopefully that helps you guys all. That is it from me. Bye for now. If you did enjoy this, do like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in another video.